Welcome to Meanwhile at the Museum, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes with the people, stories, and shenanigans that make Cincinnati Museum Center what it is. I'm Cody Hefner, and I'm joined today by Nathaniel Wyman, one of our guest experience managers here at Cincinnati Museum Center. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Happy thanks for to coming be on. By. Yeah. Thanks for spending time in the Beat Laboratory. <laughs> First question Do you go by Nathaniel, Nathan, Nate, Nate the Great, Nasty Nate? Uh, crazy Nates. What is what's your preferred? The go-to? Yeah, what's the go-to? So it depends. Uh, if it's a work setting, like if it's if it's a work email, it's going to be Nathaniel. I got to look professional. I feel like Nathaniel sure. gives off that professional <laughs> essence. Uh, more often than not, though, Nate is the go-to. Nate's when, when you unbutton that top button. Exactly. Like... Exactly. I, I went by Nathan for a while in grade school. Didn't didn't vibe with it, and then. Tried out Nat for a little bit. Yeah? Forgot that that was a bug, so stopped with that. Um, <laughs> how old were you when you were going with Nat? However old you are in third grade. <laughs> that was that one stopped pretty quickly. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. What's it like having a name that you can that you can shorten, that you can play around with? I've never had that experience. I was talking about it the other day. Like, genuinely, my biggest regret is not going with the second half instead and going by Han. Because it's in the name, I could have done it. I could have been going by Han this whole time, but it's <laughs> you still can. I still, we can edit this. It's it's too late at this point in life. You know, it, everybody knows me by Nate Nathaniel. I'm Cody Hefner, and I'm joined today <laughs> by Han Wyman. Oh, I, our, our I don't know if I like guest it, experience. No, I don't know if I like hearing it out loud. Oh my god, I we're, like the concept of it. We're like 60 seconds into this, and <laughs> and Mitch has already cut everything. People are like 60 <laughs> seconds. And I've only been listening for five. All right, so guest experiences. Explain to the people what that is. What what area of the museum are we talking about? Yeah, so we are some of the first people you'll see when you walk into the building. The giant kiosk that's in the front middle of the building, that's where we are, first and foremost. So we help out with selling the tickets, selling memberships, if somebody needs to print out their membership. And then the other spot you'll see us and my team is over at the ticket-taking spots. So making sure we've always got those friendly faces, welcoming people into the museum, saying hi, making sure little Johnny's not running in without his parents, and especially down at the Children's Museum. Oh, but, the, Children's, the Children's Museum, I was talking to someone today, they had never been there before, they'd never seen it before. And so I was showing them the woods and explaining that, and they're like, oh my God, it looks like, it looks like chaos. And I was like, it's loosely organized mm-hmm. chaos, but you need to, you need to let the kids uh, explore on their own and, and learn on their own. But you just sit there at the end of the pipeline where you know they're going to pop out. You'll catch them. Don't yep. worry about it. <laughs> but the guest experience team is is one of the most knowledgeable mm-hmm. in the building because you need to know about everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like we are there. Uh, I kind of talk about when we've got people starting in the kiosk with the training there of first and foremost, we're, you know, ticket selling, membership selling. But we're also kind of like a concierge a lot of times where even outside of the museum, We'll have people, yeah, we'll have people come up to us and they'll be like, where do I get food? It's like, I'm always going to tell you to get Skyline, maybe get Dewey's. Everybody else is going to have their own separate opinions sometimes, but. Not a a Skyline or a Dewey's sponsored podcast, but (laughs) email us at meanwhile at sensemuseum.org for any inquiries. And bring back the habanero cheese to Kroger. (laughs) Is that your go-to order at Skyline? Go-to order four cheese conies all the way with the extreme cheese. Really? Yeah. Sometimes I'll throw a Cholito in there as well. We should point out that since we're friends now and mm-hmm. we can we can use Nate, the <laughs> the hair is down. We're after hours, uh, off the clock. You're you're what six four? Close. Keep going. Six five. Keep going. Six six. Six eight. Six eight. Are mm-hmm. you really? I got it on the ID. The proof. Is- six eight and eight. <laughs> six eight a. There we go. All right. <laughs> Let's take it from the top. Take it from the top. Six eight and eight's here. <laughs> so when you hear someone saying, "All right, four Four conies all the way, mm-hmm. maybe a Toledo in there. You've got six feet and eight inches of Nate to feed. So yep. <laughs> that still doesn't seem like enough. It's it, it's more filling than you'd think, you know, especially with the chili. It's a lot of bread. <laughs> <laughs> What's your Dewey's order? Usually a calzone. Nice. Um, their calzones with the ricotta cheese is phenomenal. Usually pepperoni, black olives, and mushrooms. Because uh, they give you the three that you can yeah. always put in and- if I'm needing it, I'll add meatball in there, but sometimes usually just those three. Do you just go straight marinara? Do you do ranch? Do you do different different dipping sauces? For dipping, marinara and ranch. Okay. 
Fair enough. This is this is good. This is enlightening. <laughs> you mentioned ricotta. Mm-hmm. I grew up. Uh, my grandpa owned a dairy. My dad worked at a dairy. We grew up right next door to a dairy, and there were still so many cheeses I'd never experienced before. I, I knew nothing of ricotta. I guess my mom, when she made lasagna, was throwing that in there. Mm-hmm. Although I wouldn't be surprised if it, if she was just backfilling with cottage cheese or something. <laughs> but this is one of the things they don't tell you about. Growing up and being at all, everyone complains that, oh, why don't they teach you how to do your taxes and stuff like that in school? Why don't they teach you the full range of cheeses? Yep. For any lactose intolerant listeners, <laughs> those of you who power through anyway and you're like, I got to have it, we salute you. For those of you who are doing what many of us can't and, and living without cheese and dairy, uh, we, we salute you as well. Absolutely. Right. All right, we know your food preferences, and we'll probably come back to that because mm-hmm. there's a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of parts of the food pyramid we didn't touch on. But um, <laughs> tell me about your day to day, working in the box office, working at the kiosk, and and what guests can expect from you when they see you. Yeah, so I have worked uh, before being here. Guest facing work has always been what I've done. I've never done like anything really back of house. Um, so I've always tried to make sure I'm making each guest feel like an individual. So day to day, basically, uh, get the day started, make sure all the schedule and everything is looking right. If we ever have any call offs, anything like that, we got to get it adjusted on the fly in that little half hour period beforehand. Um, and that's not just me as well. That's myself, Jacqueline, the other manager, Nikki, Alex. We've got a whole bunch of people before we come down that are working behind the scenes to get everything ready. We come down, we get everything all sorted after the morning meeting. And then the day starts, um, especially when we're busy. It's just go, go, go the whole time. But, you know, sometimes we do have those slower days, and it's kind of checking in on everybody with the staff, making sure everybody's doing well, making sure people are getting their breaks when they need to, because obviously if you need a restroom break, you got to get that going. you got to make sure those lunches are happening on time, because <laughs> one lunch gets behind, then the rest of them are all behind. See, I used to work in the kiosk mm-hmm. as well, and the thing about lunch breaks, especially during the holidays when you have a lot of people working in the kiosk, the lunch breaks start super early, mm-hmm. and they kind of just bleed through the day. And so every now and then you're you're one of those who draws like a 10.30 or 11 a.m. lunch break. I mean, schools are like this as well. They have a lot yep. of kids to put through the cafeteria. Uh, so the lunch period changes drastically, but it's, it's something um, – Man, you saying that and and watching <laughs> you all work during the holidays when it is busy and it is all hands on deck and thinking, how do you get that many people, you know, through their lunch breaks and and to give them a little little bit of a break during the shift? Yeah. How do you all work with with other teams around the museum? Because yes, you're the first ones that people see when mm. they come in, but then you're more or less handing them off to other teams. You're handing them off to the team that's in the history museum or the museum of natural history and science and on and on. How are you coordinating with them? Yeah. So we, myself and Jacqueline both work pretty closely with Jess, the uh, floor staff manager working with getting the schedules all done well in advance ahead of time. I mean, with her tomorrow, actually (laughs) Um, trying to make sure that everything gels. And if there's ever a time where maybe we've got some people who are out on vacation and we know we're going to be a little bit short working together to be like, Hey, I'm going to need some help getting somebody staffed at the at the ticket ticket spot at History and working and being like, okay, yeah, we can do that. Or uh, if it's just a general day-to-day basis, um, a big thing obviously is having the radios, having that communication and being able to say like, hey, we've got a code going on right now. I've got, let's bring back little Johnny into the picture. We've got little Johnny here and mom and dad are nowhere to be found. And that communication that the staff has between the floor staff and my staff is phenomenal every time. And that way especially in an instance like that, they're able to get issues resolved really quickly. How much do you love using the radio? Do you, are you a big walkie talkie fan? Not really. Really? Yeah. I, I lost the allure of it when I still worked at the aquarium. (laughs) I heard myself right next to myself too many times where like I'd go to call on the radio and here it's a lot better because you know, myself, Jacqueline, it's easy. We're K1, kiosk one. At the aquarium, I had, like, numbers that I had to remember for my code. So when I worked, I was in the photography team, and then I was in their guest experience team. When I was in the photography team, it depended on when you came in for the day. So it was either I was 901 or 902 for the photography team lead. So if you came in in the morning, you were 901. 
it came in in the evening, you were 902. Why not just go CB handles at that point? Go code right. names. Why not? <laughs> if you if you had a CB handle for the walkie talkies here, what would your handle be? I feel like it's got to be Nate the Great. I mean, that's it, pretty it's good. It's right. It's right there. <laughs> that's pretty good. I mean, all right, that one was served up for you. <laughs> um, every now and then, though, uh, we'll do something with media where. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and they'll say, hey, Cody, do you want a radio? And I'm like, 100% yes. <laughs> and then I never use it because I'm also – I get intimidated by it. And yeah. I don't want to – I used to remember the different channels mm-hmm. that different teams were on. Now I have no idea. I would just throw it all into chaos. Well, it's the most ironic thing, too. I was so – like, I'm so excited to be here on the podcast. I'm absolutely going to listen to it. I hate hearing myself talk. Like, that's part of it for me as well is I just cannot stand the sound of my own voice. And it's weird because I hear my voice one way and then I listen back to it on video or in a podcast setting. And I'm like, that's that's not what I sound like. My voice isn't that. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, I I have to live through that a lot. But Mitch has started dubbing me with <laughs> Morgan Freeman, which I don't know how it, it, it matches up because... And he's pulling through a lot of archival footage to, to piece it together, right? But it's made me sound fantastic. So hey. I've appreciated that. <laughs> uh, when did you start here? At the I started Center? at the end of 2021. Okay. So jumped right in during Holiday Junction. So you're, you know, at the time of this recording, a little over two years, mm-hmm. right? Yep. You started at the end of Holiday Junction? Or? No, I started in the middle of Holiday Junction. Yeah. <laughs> How was that? How was that learning curve? Uh, yeah. My first day, Sharice was basically like, walk around, get familiar with the building, I can't train you right now because of how busy we are, which is completely okay. But you're going to greet for a little bit, and then you're going to go ticket take. I was like, yeah, okay, awesome, sounds good. And then I was ticket taking for several days, and I was like, what job am I doing? (laughs) Like, if it's the ticket taking, that's fine. Yeah. But I'm really confused. (laughs) And then finally, like, things, you know, settled down after Holiday Junction. I was able to get into the kiosk and everything, and she was like, yeah, it was... It was crazy because it was 2021, so we still had a lot of stuff going on with COVID. And that, right when I started, was when it hit our team really bad. What stood out to you from those first days? What was most memorable for you? How organized things were. Really? Yeah. Like, even though it was kind of chaotic coming in at the start, I remember distinctly not knowing where the parking lot where I could park was the first couple of days. (laughs) Or the first day specifically. So I parked out front in the north. And then walked up the giant hill, and oh, I yeah. was like, please don't let this be an everyday thing. Like, I can't. I don't have the cardio for that. <laughs> Every now and then, we'll ask people to race. When when people have <laughs> debates over where's the best place to park, mm-hmm. we'll ask them to race. And we can watch them out the windows. You can't run. You have to walk at a normal pace because you can. two people can park in the same lot, but mm-hmm. they know different pathways to get to back inside to the same spot. Yeah. So... I feel you 100% on <laughs> trying to figure out where to park. And then you kind of get to this point where this is just where you park every time. Mm-hmm. And then you start to fine tune it and realize, why am I parking here? This spot's so much closer if I just go this pathway. Yep. But well, let me let me ask you, because you brought that up, and I'm, I'm curious to hear. So if you're park, you're talking about parking in the front lots, the quickest way to get up, or are you talking about parking in our I'm talking in the, in the the back lots. The okay. front lots, you're just... So let me You're let me ask you, what's hill? your go-to path? Do you go around the side or do you go to the stairs? How do you usually go about it? If I'm parking in front, yeah, usually I go I go around the side. Okay. Although if it's summer and the fountains on, sometimes I will go uh, I will go up the stairs so I can walk by the fountain. Okay. And kind of dip your fingers in as you're walking by because it's fun to be a kid awesome yeah <laughs> what's yours do you go straight up or you go i up? i can never go around it really i like in my head i'm like i'm going around it's taking longer <laughs> which i don't know if that's actually true distance wise but i just like because a lot of the times something that we have to do uh on a day-to-day thing is going out to check out parking so i've kind of had to go out there and see Okay, what's the fastest way to get down? And the fastest way to get back inside is start helping the guests again. Yeah. And the best way is going down where the stairs are, but not taking the stairs as much as taking the little slanted ramps that are next to the stairs. Yeah. And just try not to fall down those, (laughs) but going quickly to get down each one. Because I feel like when I'm taking the steps, it's taking more steps to get down them. The steps are... (laughs) oddly shaped they're, mm-hmm. they're longer than they need to be and shallower than they than they typically are just because of the design of the building and, and the the architecture mm-hmm. 
But this is, I hope everyone's logging this as <laughs> good feedback for when you're parking in front of the building yes. and you're pushing a stroller or you said, hey, it's been a while since I've I've really dialed into the cardio. There's more of an incline here than I remember. These are the pathways, right? Yep, absolutely. I think if I remember correctly, the drive is a quarter mile from from the front doors to Western Avenue. I th- think that's right. Yeah. So we could have like mini track meets here. We could. We absolutely could. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll store that for another day. Um, so talk to us about your journey before Cincinnati Museum Center. You mentioned the aquarium. Mm-hmm. So walk us through how Nate the Great ended up here <laughs> at Cincinnati Museum Center. Yeah, absolutely. So started working in college, met my now wife while in my uh whatever She's listening so i know the year i just don't know when what year i was in in college <laughs> it was 2017 so i know that so okay. when she inevitably listens she knows that i know the year uh that counts whatever grade i was in in 2017 i think it was between like sophomore and junior year of undergrad um started working at the aquarium because we knew we were wanting to find a place together because she was living in covington okay and didn't have the best apartment so we were like well let's find a place for both of us why not and so she got me a job at the aquarium and the photography team which was great because that's what I was going to school for essentially was video production photography video okay. editing, things like that see I always wonder if if those people who are doing photos at places like that if they are actually good photographers or if it's just set up and they're just clicking the, a button you want the truth yes <laughs> I'd say it's about half and half. Okay. And I would say half of it is people that come in and they want a job working at an attraction, taking photos, and they know it's going to be more than often than anything, like the pointing, the clicking, and that's it. There was a little bit of editing to it as well, but it was like green screen Mm -hmm. where you pushed a button on the computer and it deleted the green screen out. And that it wasn't like Photoshop or Illustrator or anything like that. The other half just wants to work at the aquarium or wants to work at the zoo or something like that, which is perfectly fine until they start taking pictures of the animals instead of the people. (laughs) Yeah. When you kind of have this set up and and you're working in that controlled environment, you can dial it in, you can hone that Mm -hmm. over, over the days. And then you pick that up and you start to move around photographing moving animals makes it a little tougher, right? Yeah. So one of the coolest things that we had, and obviously it's been a while since I've been on that team, but one of the coolest things was uh, the penguin encounters. Yeah. It was an extra experience people could pay for. They'd go in, they'd have a penguin encounter with two of the people that work at the aquarium where they learn about these endangered animals that the aquarium just has as part of AZA uh, protocols. And you're in there photographing it for them, which is a really unique experience. You get to be getting a little bit more creative liberty with it, which is where you kind of see the people that know photography versus the people that don't. I could show you the camera roll on my phone and it's a lot of stuff like that. They're, they're (laughs) all pretty bad. Uh, And I'm also getting to this age where I'm taking a lot of pictures of my feet as I'm done taking photos. (laughs) You have a live photo on. And I don't know. No, no, it's not even that. It's it's its own independent photo of a blurry foot and it's i don't always delete them because sometimes i i look at it it's like watching game tape you have to see your mistakes and yep. it's just like cody be better i've had so many and i'm not i've had so many pictures on family vacations where mom goes to take the picture and oh look mom's thumb is up in the corner <laughs> <laughs> my wife got a new phone and uh it has a, a new pop socket and all that stuff and she asked me to take pictures and i could not figure out how my finger kept getting into it but it was like you were dissociating with it. And I'm like, whose <laughs> finger is that? I was like, oh, it's yours. <laughs> if I were taking professional photos for people, we're like, hey, we want to remember, we want to document and remember this experience we had. Mm-hmm. Can you can you take our photo and and please make sure that you put your finger over our smiling child's face? Put the face little tiny the part in the corner. Well, the, the more aggravating is when it's like that little bit in the corner when you're like, oh, I see it, that and, little I, haze. and I can't edit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get like the little bit where it's like, is there a shadow all of a sudden? Like, what is happening? <laughs> You're the the guest concierge here. Yep. What tips would you have for parents, for families coming in, trying to take pictures of loved ones, of friends, to capture that moment here? What are you? What are your tips for taking a good photo? Yeah. So you definitely want to make sure you get a good background. For the pictures, obviously in the rotunda, you got a lot of options. Um, Anything with one of the murals is going to be great with the mosaics. 
I'm gonna interrupt you. If you yeah. were doing if you were doing your senior photos here, okay, what three locations would you pick as your background for those? One out in front okay. with the museum front behind you. I'm gonna say one in the rotunda with the mural behind you. Mm-hmm. As much of like a telescopic way as you could get it. That way you're not getting just one side of it. You're getting as much of the both of them. And one with the Displetosaurus with the skyline behind you. And we're back to skyline. <laughs> that's all right. All right. That's so key spots for anyone who wants to to maximize their photos mm-hmm. here. But all right, what else? Find a good backdrop. Mm-hmm. What's next? Get creative with it. Um, you know, get a little bit lower for an angle, get a little bit higher for an angle. And I'd say that's a good way to kind of make it stand out for fun pictures, you know, instead of it just being the normal head on picture. But take more pictures than you need to as well. And I say that all the time anyway, and it applies to video. I'm sure Mitch would agree with this as well. You want to get more than what you need. If you're just snapping away with your phone, with a camera, whatever you're using, you might think you didn't get something, but then you look back and say it's, you know, mom's holding the baby and you wanted a picture of the baby not crying and mom smiling. But if you're just snapping away, there might be a picture somewhere in there where just a candid shot, you know, maybe mom and baby are looking at one of the dinosaurs or mom and baby are looking over the model of downtown Cincinnati sure. over in the history museum, like something that captures more candid shots rather than stage shots. I love seeing people just go all out for, mm-hmm. for the photo. Um, you know, you get parents who are kind of laying on the floor trying to get, <laughs> trying to get, uh, eye level view of their mm-hmm. toddler or something like that. Uh, more often than you'd think, you'll see people laying on their back and taking photos of the rotunda, which is which is very cool. Uh, just grown adults, and inevitably there's another person standing next to them with their arms crossed, just kind of waiting for them to to wrap yeah. up. <laughs> but I'm like, don't don't hate on them. That's yeah. gonna be a great shot. Oh yeah, I've gotten. I think it's I, I saw it earlier today. My Facebook cover photo is right after I left the Omnimax, overlooking the entirety of the rotunda. I know it's from a while ago because the poster was Dinosaurs of Antarctica. Okay. (laughs) And it's like, it's such a cool image to have, you know, because you get the uh, mosaics that are in the back of the building, those two that are backed by Omnimax, and you can see not quite the rest of the rotunda, but you can see and you know what's there, you know. The banners as a way to date the photo is really Mm -hmm. interesting. That's something fun when you look back at photos and you're either seeing staff members that you've worked with and you say, oh, that person left in uh, in July 2022, so it has to be before that. Or you see a banner for Dinosaurs of Antarctica. Um, there's there's a photo that I see often that pops up in our, in our folders that has our Egypt exhibit from 2019 mm-hmm. on it. So it's it's fun to see when these photos are and then you start to think back how long how long ago was that how many have we had in between that so the little forensic science of going into these photos yeah. and figuring out like what the date lines are is pretty cool well and kind of with that as well so i am a very forgetful person and i will forget my phone in places around the kiosk all the time it doesn't happen as often recently because i've been less forgetful but when i first started for a good while I would, you know, we'd go back to the cash room at the end of the day or I'd go to the restroom or something like that and forget my phone in the kiosk. And I would come back to like 60 pictures that people on the staff just were just rapid fire taking pictures. And I I made a folder. It's been like six months since I did it. But there was over a thousand photos Uh, of (laughs) since when I've started of just just gorilla photos on Nate's phone. Yep. That's awesome. (laughs) That's great. I love that idea. All right, back to the storyline. So you're <laughs> you're at Newport Aquarium. Yes. And then what happens? Uh, so Newport Aquarium from 2017 to 2019. And 2019 is when I graduated from undergrad at NKU. And then uh, one of our biggest, for myself and Amy, one of our biggest journeys and jumps was we moved to Orlando and started working at Disney World. Did you really? Yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> it was not what we were hoping for is the best way I can put it. So we, I had been trying to get into the Disney college program since I was a freshman in college. Um, Tried twice, didn't get it. And I knew like, obviously the window was running down because it's the Disney college program. You can't apply for it when you're not in school. 
the last time you can apply for it is like if you're graduating, you can still do it like the summer or the semester afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'll give it one more shot. What's the worst that can happen? They say no again, whatever. I uh, had the interview and got the position. I was told I was going to be getting the, into the Disney College program. And we were just over two years of being together at that point. And we were like, let's do it. You know, we both were self-proclaimed and everybody knows it, Disney adults. <laughs> and we were like, let's move to Disney. You know, she worked at the aquarium as well. She worked with guests. I worked with guests. We were like, let's move to Orlando. Let's work at what is one of the premier guest experience destinations in the world. Right. And it took a while for us to find out if she got a job down there to begin with, because she did get an interview. But then after the interview, it was essentially like, well, when we have something for you, we'll let you know. Right. Yeah. And we were like, well, we need to know soon because he's going down for the college program. And it was a whole thing. We ended up getting an apartment down there that was like 45 minutes away from where we were working with tolls. Yeah. Toll roads the worst. <laughs> Super smooth though, right? I mean, it's Florida, so <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, I ended up working at, I don't know how familiar you are with, with Disney World. I was at Magic Kingdom okay, working yeah, yeah. in a kitchen uh, at Pecos, Pecos Bill's Tall Tale Inn and Cafe, I think is the name of it. Uh, because um, Tall Tale is an amazing Disney movie. It's a It's a hidden gem for anyone mm-hmm. looking Put that on double feature with the Rocketeer, and you're yes, having a good time. Yes, um, but I was working back of house in the in the kitchen there, which wasn't really what I was going for. I was hoping to be, you know, working photo pass there because it was kind of a direct transition from my work at the time at the aquarium. Yeah, and she ended up getting what should have been and could have been really awesome. Uh, she was part of the opening day team for the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge Park. Cool. That opened at Hollywood Studios. And things just, the, the easiest and quickest way to put it is just things just didn't work out. And we, we came home. We came back up to Northern Kentucky, got an apartment back in Covington, and been in Covington area ever since. Both came back to the aquarium. And that was 2019. So we were only down in Orlando for a couple of months we weren't down there for too long yeah which ended up being a good thing (laughs) given the time period um obviously covid happened and we were able to still be at the aquarium during that time we were both brought back after you know things were kind of figured out of Mm -hmm. the best way to reopen safely uh and at the same time right before covid broke out we uh i got a job at campbell media over in northern kentucky working for a small uh media center that basically work to uh, film city council meetings, different meetings like that, and got to film live sports cool. for the high schools as well, which was pretty cool. What's your favorite sport to film? Soccer. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Knowing you, knowing you, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it's Well, and it's it's cool, too, because with that, uh, I helped like come up with some ideas for like scoreboard ideas for the edits at, for afterwards, because usually the only one we do live was either basketball or football. Because it was for Campbell County High School, so it was the county school, huge production. We had a we had a production truck that we took with us. We would always get there super early for the games. Giant cables going on top of the press box. All of us had our headsets with our big cameras and everything. Like it felt like a like an NFL broadcast. It was it was so cool. Football is a big deal around here, so it that definitely makes sense. is. Yeah. Are you still a Disney adult? Oh, absolutely. Still, all right. A little bummed out to kind of like not have it work out you know but we got engaged at disney world um in 2021 that's awesome yeah so we i was i was a little worried (laughs) going because we knew we were going there we went right after my brother's wedding and you know my parents knew obviously i knew and i was worried i wasn't worried she was going to say no but i was worried she was going to be like not at disney world like (laughs) things didn't go well but i was like a big thing in our relationship has always been making better memories out of things that didn't go well, you know? And I was like, this is a perfect chance to make a better memory out of something that wasn't what we wanted. It's just another milestone for you both. Exactly. It's just a, a moment that you you shared and got through together. Yeah. So do you remember the first Disney film you saw or your first introduction to Disney? So I don't remember the first Disney movie I saw. 
I know, so my family, we've been going to the Disney parks, specifically Disney World, more than anything since I was a little little kid. Um, we've I've been a, a decent amount of times. I don't know exactly how often, um, but enough to where it's been a huge part of my life. And it was like one of the first things when Amy and I started talking, I was like, well, what's your favorite Disney movie? And we were talking, uh, hers is Beauty and the Beast, mine okay. is Lion King. Kind of tracks for knowing (laughs) you're of that era. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, But I I would say one of the first that I remember is Finding Nemo. Okay. Uh, And that being always like my go to. I'm if I had to stay at home if I was sick, put that on the TV and just makes the day better type thing. Even as an adult, there's something really comforting about Disney movies and cartoons mm-hmm. and stuff like that when, when you don't feel well. I don't know what the science behind it is. <laughs> it just uh, it hits right. When oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You as long as you, you watch the right one. Like, I'm not going to watch Up if I'm not feeling good. <laughs> that's Okay, that's that's true. you got to be in the right mindset. But that's, it. you know, it's got... Uh, I've never seen up, so I'm I'm just spitballing here. Mm-hmm. But it's got a happy ending in, in some does. way. It does. You know? It's just you got to get through the beginning, and the beginning is hard. <laughs> Sometimes when one relationship ends, you form a new one in a different way that you never experienced. That's true. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thanks, IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been here. Uh, let's see. Let's do the math. A little over two years, two mm-hmm. and a half years. We'll call it. Yeah. What have been some of your highlights? Some of your favorite days here at the museum? Yeah. So like I said before, one of my biggest things is uh, I'll try to, if I, if the instance calls for it, make guests feel like an individual and not feel like they're just another person coming in. And this is still always one of my favorite interactions I've ever had where we had a family come in and they came visiting from children's hospital. And they had, we have like a partnership with them, I believe, where they can get the comped out tickets for however many people are there. And they came in, and she was just kind of telling me about what their their story was, like why they were up here, came up here for a surgery. I think they were from South Carolina, wow. if I remember correct. Yeah. I, I could be completely wrong and remember. It was, it's been a little while. But just talking with them, and we actually were able to work, and I worked with Kelsey to get them set up with a membership oh, so cool. that they were able to come back more than just the one time. Because... Obviously, they could have gone back and gotten the tickets again from Children's, but this way I was able to, you know, establish that connection with them and talk to them and kind of be like, the next time you come in, you can just come straight in. You don't have to wait in a long line. You don't have to worry about getting these tickets redeemed or anything like that. You can just go in and you can come in as often as you want. Because the way their situation was, was she was there with the one little boy and then dad and the rest of the family was back home. And basically, if I'm remembering correctly, they would drive halfway, meet, and switch. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I was like, this is the very least that I can do to try and, you know, take your mind off of what's going on. Yeah. And In a way, it also helps that family feel like they're not really away from home. It establishes mm-hmm. some sense of, of place for them yeah. in Cincinnati. and. You know, being that far away from home and, and what they're experiencing, and what they're going through, being able to establish Cincinnati Museum Center as their place or as a mm-hmm. place where they can just be together and mm-hmm. not have to worry about everything else, even for a little bit, is, is really special. Yeah. And not, to your point, not just doing it for that day, but setting them up for that for the long run. Yeah. And they, I have seen them multiple times since. And every time I always make at least a few minutes to go over, talk with them. See how things are going. Check in. Uh, I think they're. I think it's about time for them to come back in <laughs> sometime soon as well. I think it's about. It's been about a year since then. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now you mentioned your favorite sport to shoot was soccer. Yeah. Did you play soccer? I know you're a big soccer fan. I did not play soccer. No, I played it when I was a really little kid, and that was it. I mean, you'd be a great goalie. Six, that's, eight. that's what I did when I was a little kid because I was, you know, taller than the rest <laughs> still at that point. But, yeah, I mean, I'm wildly unathletic. Like, wow, I'm very unathletic is the best. Like, there's no better way to put it. I'm good at tennis, kind of, but that's mostly just because I can just reach and just smack the ball back. 
<laughs> like <laughs> just from I don't, anywhere on the court. I don't yeah. have to be very like coordinated for it. You know, as long as I can see where the ball is, and I can hit it before it bounces a second time. I'm good. <laughs> how are you at Wii tennis? Oh, phenomenal. Are you? It translates. Do you know how to do like the ball spin and stuff like that? It's, I never figured that out. It's been a while, but I did know how to do it. I never knew how to get it to do like the power serve where the ball was on fire. Oh, yeah. I could never get that down. But like I knew some of the tricks, like how to throw like the inside curve or like the inside fastball on the Wii baseball. If you ever go back and look at old game graphics from the 90s and stuff, you're like, man, this is it's real pixelated. And then you go back and you look at the Wii and people thought, that character looks just like me. It's like, mm-hmm. all right, let's. let's <laughs> he doesn't it. have arms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's. Yeah, the little. Um, just the just little, little bald fist. Yeah, the little bald fist. It <laughs> looked like we pulled him out of the energy zone downstairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what is it about soccer that you enjoy so much? Have you always been a soccer fan, or did that really develop no, with it, FC? It around the same time as as supporting FCC. Um, I can actually pinpoint to where. I started watching it more, and when I figured out what team I wanted to support outside of FC Cincinnati, and that was when I was studying abroad my freshman year of college in South Africa. We went to a restaurant just randomly while we were down there, and they had the 2008 Champions League final, which is like the big tournament for club teams in Europe, and it was Manchester United against Chelsea. It's when Cristiano Ronaldo still played for Manchester United, and I basically watched this eight-year-old replay and just watching them play, I was like, oh, this is phenomenal. And I've regretted it ever since because being a Manchester United fan is so painful. Is it? (laughs) Yes. It's, there's so many, so many different things. Like the team will play so well one week. They'll win, like this week, they won three to nothing against West Ham United. They're probably going to turn around and lose like two to zero on their next game against a team they shouldn't. I don't get it. I don't ever understand it. And there's so many like behind the scenes things. Like you just scroll on Twitter and you're just seeing all these like leaks from the clubhouse of the team where like the, they're not happy with the manager and it's all this stuff. And it's like, can I just have a drama free team, please? <laughs> but man, you, that's kind of, it's the, it's sort of the glamour team. Yeah. Right. If you, if you ever remember seeing the early Ted Lasso bits, um, the Dallas Cowboys oh, is yeah. essentially what they yeah. equ- what he equated them to. It attracts a lot of stars, but sometimes the more stars you have, the more tension and the more yep. drama you have around it. Yep. I played soccer in high school, and I, I first went to a Columbus Crew game. Mm. This was before FC Cincinnati even existed, mm-hmm. and like the size of it, the size of the field, and everything is is so impressive when you're there oh, yeah. in person. But even then, it did not. I don't want to turn off our any of our Columbus <laughs> listeners, but the the crew atmosphere did not at all look anything like what FC's atmosphere looks like. Here. Oh my gosh, it's in, it's insane! Like I've I've been going to games since the very first season. Uh, I've gone with my friend Jerry and his his dad and his brother, and we started off in the Bailey at Nippert when they still were playing there. Oh yeah, and I remember the like it was the first season, so none of us had any idea what was going on. So we would be in Nippert in the Bailey, and we were in the front row in the Bailey. It was before, like, all the supporter groups and everything, and we were like, this is insane. Like, there's, what, 35,000 people is the most they had one time? And we were there, and we were like, this is electric. Like, the atmosphere here is unmatched. We skipped right over the fact that you were in South Africa. <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to go back to that? Yeah. I want to go back to that. <laughs> what were you doing in South Africa? Yeah. Because so, that's that's not come up anywhere on your journey so far. When we were talking about the work, I started after that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it was my second semester of college, uh, so end of freshman year. Wow. You just leading off <laughs> strong in right. college. And then everything went. No, uh, <laughs> um, but it was a part of a study abroad class about documentary filmmaking. Oh, cool. Yeah. I was the co-director of a film about wildlife conservation where we covered, or at least the attempt was to cover four different animals. The African elephant, the black rhino, I believe was the other one, and then African penguins and great white sharks. Wow. And Great White Sharks was kind of thrown in because I was like, we could get some really good footage if we do a shark cage dive. And we did end up doing that. So I have footage that I shot on a GoPro 
of us in a cage with great white sharks, one of which it breaches out of the water towards the camera. You were in the cage? Mm-hmm. That's crazy. After the worst motion sickness I've ever had in my life. <laughs> was it terrifying? <laughs> Not really, but I think it's also because I was really out of it because the way it went, to, we went with a very reputable thing. It wasn't like we were like, oh, let's find something. You know, we booked it well in advance. Um, it was actually really cool. The company we went with was called like Apex Expeditions or something like that because they're the apex predator of the ocean. Yeah. And the owner of that company has made so many specials for Shark Week for Discovery Channel. And I was like, you can't see it. Obviously, we're on the podcast, but I was this close to being able to get an interview with him. That'd be cool. And it just fell apart at the end, unfortunately. But uh, it was it was incredible. But the way we got there was we took a boat from the shore out, I want to say maybe about an hour out into sea. And it was three meter swells, which was nine feet up and nine feet back down. <laughs> and the we all had wetsuits that we had to change into. You know, you put the swimsuit on under the wetsuit. Yeah. The only one of us, I think there was five or six of us that went, only one of us had the smart idea to wear the swimsuit onto the boat so that you didn't have to go into the bathroom to change into the wetsuit. Because of that, the bathroom, as we've established, I am six foot eight. The bathroom was about five foot seven. <laughs> so nine foot swells up and down. In a five foot seven bathroom, trying to squeeze into a wetsuit that was not for my size. <laughs> There's a photo of me on the front of the boat, and I look like I just saw a ghost. <laughs> you were so sick, you were like, just let the sharks take me. I yeah. don't care. At that point, I was like, we got in the water, and we were the last ones to do it. We almost missed it. Some of us did, because I wasn't the only one getting sick. Not just saying that, but we, we were like, they were about to be like, this is the last time you can go down. And we were like, Oh God, we gotta we gotta do this. Like we we paid to come do this. We can't miss this. Right. And we got in, and it's the water was freezing, um, because the wetsuit, like I said, wasn't quite the right size. So there were some gaps. <laughs> it was it was cold, but it one of the best experiences I've ever had. Just seeing a like literally go right past the cage, with like maybe a foot opening. To where it swam past, and had I not been smart, could have stuck my hand out and touched it. Are they just massive? Yeah. And the ones that we saw were juveniles. No kidding. And they were like 14 feet long. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. They were insane. I'll show you the pictures. That's cool. <laughs> so how did the video turn out? Good. Yeah. We had a lot of different uh, edits. You know, there was a decent amount of people that were in the class. Um, I took a class my last year there where it was just the project class just editing that and we focused specifically on the penguin aspect of it and ended up with a 15 minute long project with the different interviews that we got the longest part of which was transcribing the interviews because it's kind of hard to get through the South African accent <laughs> and getting through and being like okay because we had we put in some subtitles of some parts, and there was one interview that we just completely had to scrap. Really? Because we were like, I, I don't know what she's saying. Like, and they told us ahead of time too. They were like, she has a very very thick accent. She is a lovely person. Still do the interview with her. Just be prepared. You're probably not going to use it. Interesting. <laughs> and sure enough, we the uh, Jerry who I mentioned earlier was in the class with me. And we're editing this, and he and I just looked at each other and we we're like, yeah, no, th th she's not making the cut. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people don't understand is is these podcast episodes start out two hours long and Mitch has to cut the you know <laughs> 50, 50, 55 minutes that's usable from me. So yep. thanks, it, Mitch. <laughs> yeah. So Mitch feels you on that one. <laughs> Mitch here jumping in to make sure everyone knows that that was a joke. Uh, we usually record around an hour and lose only a few minutes in the edit. Back to you, Cody. Wow, this is this is flown by. <laughs> But before we let you go, mm -hmm. I got to know, if you could trade roles with anyone in the museum for a day, who would you trade roles with and why? That's a great question. It's a little bit of an awkward answer, but I'm going to say it. I want to switch roles with you. With me? Yeah. Okay. Not we, actually. We, like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> why? What do you... I don't know. It's just like, I, I love... Renew my, renew my love for my job. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I love what I do, but no, I, I would love to hear. I, I just love the idea of like, 
even though I don't like hearing myself talk like we've established. Like I like, you know, the the outreach of going out and like selling how awesome it is to come to the museum and, you know, the new things that are coming to the museum and going and, you know, having the connections and meeting the people that you meet. And, you know, most recently when we had Santa come in on the helicopter, yeah, just watching you like go to each of the camera person, you were like, are you good? You got everything you need? Good. Okay. Stand over there. Cause otherwise you're going to get hit by rocks. <laughs> I try as much as possible to give them someone who's a better interviewer and knows more than I do. <laughs> I'm a lot of times I'm the, the last resort for that. But so, I mean, I started where you are mm-hmm. and that was kind of one of the leaping off points for me was every time someone comes in, I'm telling them what they should do, what they, oh, you want to know what this film's about here? Boom. Yep. I'll tell you that. And, oh, you only have two hours. Here's how you're going to plan your day. Yep. Stuff like that. So for you to do what you do and your entire team, like you're the the hype people for the museum. And you mentioned you're the concierge. You are planning their entire journey for them because mm-hmm. a lot of times – even members, when they come in, sometimes they're, what's new? It's been a little bit since I've been here. Or, hey, what's the new Omnimax film yeah. this week? And, and on and on. So, I mean, it's really not that far off. You just don't, people aren't showing a camera in your face <laughs> to do it. And there's, I don't know, maybe you feel a little less pressure that you're not going <laughs> to say the wrong thing or mispronounce something. That happens a lot. I said Displetosaurus earlier, and as soon as I said it, I was like, please, I hope I said that right. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I'm like, wait, is that not what it is? That's how I said it. <laughs> so I've been doing interviews before uh, in the dinosaur hall, and they say, what's this one called? That's a Galliumopus. Okay, great. And they sit there for a second, and they're like, wait, what is it? I'm like, it's a Galliumopus. And they're just, just butchering it. They just can't get it. Yeah. And I said, how about we do this? You say where are we standing right now and i'll say we're standing in front of a gallium opus and then we just go on with it and they go okay good that works <laughs> like let's not let's not try to force it so um given the content you're you're always sort of dancing around something else in a, a different topic mm-hmm. um trying to dive in and be an expert on it and what i've always been so impressed by is what the entire guest experience team does from a research perspective and what they know about things and, and what they're telling guests about. And um, just like that knowledge of seeing the entire museum through a guest eyes. Yeah. So that you're you're giving them the absolute best experience and, you know, sizing up, you know, how old their kids might be or, you know, what is, you know, what is she into? What is she really mm-hmm. like? All right, then you got to go here. You got to do this. You got to make sure you do this. Yep. I try as often as I can at the end of a transaction just – and especially if they've just got the museum admission, just, and what do you guys want to start with today? Do you want to start with science? Do you want to start, see some dinosaurs? Do you start, want to start with history and see Cincinnati? <laughs> Literally. Right. Or let's be real. Do you want to start with the plane at the children's museum? <laughs> I'd say a good eight out of 10 times. It's to look at each other. Children's museum. Yeah. Okay. Elevators or escalators. You have fun. <laughs> As we're wrapping up, what is the one can't miss thing for people to do and see when they're here at the museum center from your perspective? From my perspective, I'm going to say it just because it's sometimes the hardest thing for people to find. And it's the one thing that I remember so much from coming in as a kid, public landing. Somehow one of the hardest things to find, I find myself telling people different routes and different ways to get to it. If you come in, as long as you got a ticket, you can scan your ticket at the exit. And you can go in and it's almost right there. But if you want to go in at the top, you can start at the top of the History Museum. And you're allowed to keep walking where it might not look like you're supposed to with the signs. Just follow the signs. Make your way and see public landing. Because it, it literally looks like you've stepped back in time into the 1800s. It's, it's phenomenal. You've got the sound effects, the boat. You can go play checkers for a little bit if you want to down there. It's, it's incredible. We have days on these Tuesdays and Wednesdays where Jacqueline and I maybe we'll take a break from work for a little bit and we'll go down into public landing for five minutes just to you know get up and walk around and it's obviously the easy answer is Dino Hall but Dino Hall is right there you're going to be hard pressed to miss it whereas I feel like there's a lot of times that people do miss public landing and it's the one thing where anytime I'm showing somebody like when I give them that prompt of, do you want to start with science, history, or children's, if they pick science, I will give them a suggestion of where and how to do it. 
where I'll say, start in science. You're going to exit through the space gallery, go across the, the avenue down on the lower level, see the Children's Museum if you want to. If you don't have kids and you don't want to go into it, that's fine. Then go into the exit of history. That way you can go see it first and foremost. It is absolutely one of my favorite things here. I don't think we can say it any better than that. <laughs> Nate, you've been great, as promised. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Meanwhile at the Museum. Remember, if you liked what you heard, please rate and subscribe. But more importantly, come see for yourself. Visit cincymuseum.org to see the latest reasons to visit. If you have any questions, comments, or just want to tell us how much you love the show, send us an email at meanwhile at cincymuseum.org. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>